In this program, we'll examine the key elements of a telephone network. We will follow the paths your data signals take from the phone line terminal block in your office to another terminal block in a distant city. An overview of the paths for your data signals will help to take a lot of the mystery out of data transmission. The transmission isn't that mysterious if you have some idea about what is going on with the data transmitted from your terminal. Installation, troubleshooting, designing networks, and selecting equipment can all be much easier if you know what is going on inside the phone system. Your data first passes through the wiring inside your building. This wire is referred to as inside wiring by the phone companies. This inside wire may be owned by the customer or by the phone company. The wires from the data lines and phone lines in your building all come together in a large terminal in some out-of-the-way place in your office. This may be in a basement or in a closet. The central point has many cable pairs terminated in it, allowing it to be used for many different phones, for data, and for other services, and often for many different customers. This terminal may contain from 25 pairs of phone wires up to several hundred, depending on the size and needs of the building. Each cable pair is color-coded according to industry standards. In addition, cable pairs are always identified by some numbering system. For instance, this cable is number 32 here at the terminating block. We find the same cable number 32 here at the telephone. The phone numbers to the outside are also identified at the terminating block. In larger systems, more elaborate engineering records must be kept to identify and manage the wiring. If the phone company owns and maintains the inside wiring, they also maintain the records. If the customer owns the wiring, the customer is responsible for the record keeping. The routing from the building may be by aerial or underground cable. The trend is to use underground cable as much as possible. The cable always enters the telephone company's central office underground. The wire from your building to the central office is usually just plain wire all the way. Over the years, as the wiring system grows, changes, and is repaired, the path to the central office may change. Also, the main wiring trunks grow into a branching tree structure. One result of this evolution of the system is that some phone wires from your office to the phone company can have extra lengths of wire that are no longer active. These extra lengths are called bridge taps. If a phone line is more than six miles from the central office, devices called loading coils are put on the wires. Loading coils are used to improve the quality of voice transmission by concentrating the energy in the voice range. In the phone company's central office, the cable is terminated on an apparatus called a main frame. This main frame provides lightning protection and a convenient point for cross-connecting various pieces of equipment such as coils, pads, and test jacks using jumper wires. The purpose of the coils and pads is to make all incoming calls appear to have about the same electrical characteristics. The test jacks are for more convenient testing of phone lines. Lines for dial-up service are connected to the switching machine. At the central office, dial lines have battery power applied. This allows the phone to ring, touch tones to be sent, and voice information to be sent, all without any power source for the phone at the home or office. For dial-up service, the pair from your office is cross-connected to the switching machine, which will provide dial tone, signaling to the distant end for billing and ending calls, transmission path for voice or data, and the timing of your call. Timing of the call starts when the called party answers. The switching machine has the capability of selecting an idle trunk from among the many paths available. At the distant city, another switching machine allows your call to ring the telephone number you have dialed. During busy hours, it would be very unlikely that the same sender and receiver would be linked over the same path on successive calls. But during hours of low usage, it is possible for the switching machine to select the same trunk on successive calls to the same distant city. For dial-up data calls, if you have a bad line during busy periods, hang up and dial again. You will probably get a different line. At night, another call may not be routed over a different line. For the phone company, the many different paths available during the day make daytime troubleshooting more difficult for dial-up calls. The local phone company facilities are designed to limit the loss of signal between the central office and the subscriber's phone. At the common test frequency of 1,004 cycles per second, or 1,004 hertz, the second loss should be no greater than 10 decibels or 10 dB. If a dial-up line is ordered as a data line, the line must meet tighter standards from the jack to the central office. At 1,004 hertz, the signal can still be down as much as 10 dB, 
but at a frequency of 2700 hertz, losses can be no more than 3 dB more than the loss at 1004 hertz. An example of the worst case connection on a call would be 10 dB in each subscriber loop and 5 dB between switching centers. With an output signal level of minus 9 dB from the data set or modem, you would have a minus 34 dB received signal level. Experience has shown that you usually have a receive level nearer minus 27 dB. To summarize the effect of the various signal losses on a long distance call, here is a graphic representation of a long distance call. A short piece of wire has virtually no loss. A dial modem transmits at minus 9. The line to the central office with loading looks like this, adding 10 dB of loss. The long distance carrier adds 5 dB more and the last leg from the distant central office to the end point adds the final 10 dB of loss. Now we will move on and consider the transmission path for a four-wire private line. This service requires the use of two cable pairs from your business office to the phone company central office. One pair is used for transmitting and this is normally the red and green pair on your data line connecting block. The pair for receiving is normally the yellow and black pair on your connecting block. This set of two pairs with this color scheme holds true for each end of the circuit. Located at each subscriber or customer location are coils and pads also containing a loopback device to assist in testing. At the central office, the two pairs of data lines are wired to test jacks, to coils and pads for level coordination, and then to some kind of carrier system to the distant end. The private line circuits entirely bypass the dial switching system. Between central offices, the four wire lines go over the same choices of wire, microwave, fiber optics, or satellite that dial calls use. Unlike dial calls, the private lines stay on the same pass at all times. This makes troubleshooting easier. At the distant end, central office, the data line will again be connected to circuit coils, pads, and test jacks. The nominal end-to-end -end circuit loss for four wire applications is 16 dB plus or minus 3 dB over the long term. Most private line data sets have received sensitivity to minus 25 dB, which will provide plenty of margin below the nominal 16 dB level. There are three parameters for private data lines. If these three parameters are within limits, you have at least a 90% confidence factor that your line will pass data successfully. These are steady state background noise, net loss, and frequency response. Background noise should be minus 45 dB or lower. Net loss should be close to 16 dB, within the 3 dB plus or minus change over the long term. This provides a spread of about 29 dB between signal and noise. Signal loss should be nearly as low, that is within 3 dB, at 2700 Hz as at 1004 Hz. As a subscriber, you are vitally interested in what happens when you have trouble and call the telephone company. Let's consider the dial-up service first. Your call is received by a repair clerk who writes your complaint on a trouble ticket along with your telephone number and the number you are calling. This trouble ticket is passed to a test man who looks to the records associated with your telephone number. The records called line cards contain trouble history, pair assignments, and any other pertinent information. Next he will ask for a test line to the cable pair at the main frame. This test line terminates at a test board where he can check the pair for shorts, opens, and grounds. He will also check for any capacity imbalance which could be caused by being crossed with another conductor. This procedure will complete his initial test. If you believe the problem is at the distant end, a trouble report to the telephone company at that end must be initiated for the phone number at the other end. Dial-up service troubleshooting is very difficult and with the advent of divestiture it is compounded. Since you can choose which long distance company to use, you are usually dealing with three separate companies in just the long distance facilities alone. One of the best things to do on occasional failure is simply to hang up and redial. If you did not specifically order service for data lines, the telephone company will be less concerned with data transmission failures as long as the line passes voice successfully. Private line service is much easier to troubleshoot because specific facilities are dedicated to the line. The problem of multiple paths encountered with dial-up lines is eliminated. Now here again, the trouble call to the long distance company is received by a repair clerk who makes out a trouble ticket and passes it on to a tester. Each private line has a circuit number assigned to it, so this number must be given when trouble is reported. The tester locates the line card for this circuit. 
the card lists every piece of telephone company equipment associated with the circuit and also lists the test results at the time of installation. Testing can be done from telephone company office to office since the in sections can be tested using the loopback feature installed with all private lines. The line from the central office to the subscriber terminal block is tested by passing a tone down the line. The tone commands the loopback device to loop the line, sending the tone back to the central office for evaluation. Since divestiture, there is no end-to-end -end testing of lines that pass through different telephone companies. There are some other important points to keep in mind when ordering circuits now that divestiture has taken place. The customer can order several circuit segments and have them connected together in any configuration desired. Each circuit segment would have an assigned number and in case of trouble, each of the circuit numbers would have to be given to the repair clerk. The best way to order private data circuits is to order the service from the long distance company and specify the end points rather than piece together your own circuit. Then only one circuit number need be given when you place a trouble call. This diagram shows how a long distance call enters the long distance network and a simplified diagram showing various routing options. Of course, there is more than one long distance service now. You have the option of routing your call through any of a number of long distance networks, or you might deal with a company which will route calls for you over lines the company has leased at wholesale rates. Whatever your specific situation, it will be easier to manage your data networks with more complete knowledge of how the telephone network is put together and how trouble calls are handled.